This is a production of Cornell University. We hope you'll join us for book signing after the reading up on the second floor of Goldwyn Smith. And um, I, I must thank Barbara and David Zelaznik for co-sponsoring the biennial Chasen Reading, which was established in 1980 by Margaret Rosenzweig in memory of Robert Chasen. Now, many stellar poets have given this reading, including long before probably our time, Howard Nemiroff, um, Lucille Clifton, and more recent, well, John Ashbery, too, long time ago, uh, more recently, Rita Dove and Charles Simic. Today, I have the honor of introducing Marilyn Hacker, a formal genius and virtuoso, if that word can connote astounding feats of substance as well as technical skill. Hacker's renown is international. She's the author of 13 poetry books, an essay collection, Unauthorized Voices, and a collaborative book, Diaspora Renga, co-authored with Dima Shihabi. Her 16 translations from the French include Marie Etienne's King of a Hundred Horsemen, which received the American Penn Award for Poetry and Translation. Her first book, Presentation Piece, won the National Book Award. And her most recent collection, A Stranger's Mirror, New and Selected Poems, was nominated for the same award. She's received two Lambda Literary Awards, the Lenore Marshall Award of the Academy of American Poets, a Penn Award for Poetry, and the Argana Prize from the House of Poetry in Morocco. Marilyn Hacker has been called a radical formalist, and it's hard to think of a formal structure she has not inhabited and invigorated. Few poets have thought as steadfastly and deeply about the structural possibilities of verse or worked the language with such unobtrusive grace, a fluidity that lends the lines a conversational ease. Hacker has called form one rampant of sanity. And in a recent interview, she said, it's the history of the form as well as the form itself that helps to shape a poem what it has done or has not done in past incarnations. The poet, writing a sonnet, a huzzle, is often dialoguing with that history, with specific poets, with the transmutations of a form between languages, going violently against the grain of the tradition, as well as becoming part of it. Her own history, as a writer, began at the Bronx High School of Science, reading poetry books borrowed from the public library. At the age of 16, she was admitted to NYU, where she majored in French literature. In her early 20s, she lived in San Francisco and was immersed in the West Coast aesthetic, uh, Jack Spicer Circle, Robert Duncan, Gary Snyder. As she's noted, there were not a lot of women poets present with whom to engage in discussion. Her poems have a vivid pictorial sense of place from New York City to the neighborhoods of Paris, and more recently, the ravaged landscape of Syria. They are sensual poems full of wine, cigarettes, coffee, rain, cafes, and even kisses. But Hacker puts the post in post-romanticism with her attentive, deeply informed historical sense. Her work often bears witness to macrocosms of cruelty, from the Valdive roundup of Parisian Jews in 1942 to present day internment camps. Compassionate, empathetic, these poems afford virtual homes and presence to the silenced diaspora of political mayhem. They offer solace and a reason to persist. They are intensely social poems, keenly aware of other lives, a generosity that shows in tributes or elegies to friends and fellow travelers, as well as strangers glimpsed through a window or on the street. These poems are never merely descriptive, and Hacker's view is not that of a passive bystander. When she gazes into a stranger's mirror, she sees herself. The boundaries are permeable, as she imagines the human scale of geography, from the hearts of Parisian schoolgirls to the souls of refugees. 
otherness dismantled by such empathy transcends observation and testifies to our interconnectedness, the permeability of all conscious entities. From the beginning, there's been a surprising nakedness in Hacker's work, an abundant honesty in the autobiographical details. Her poems seem core samples of an examined life. In this excerpt from Almost a Valediction, she writes, you happened to me, I was happened to, like an abandoned building by a bulldozer, like the van that missed my skull happened to two inch gash across my chin. You were as deep down as I've ever been. You were inside me like a pulse, a newborn flailing toward maternal heartbeat through the shock of cold and glare. When you were gone, Swaddled in strange air, I was that alone again, inventing life left after you. She's a great love poet, and she's something more rare, a great poet of friendship. In her poems, friends gather to talk, eat, drink. There's so much wine that it begins to seem sacramental. <laughs> a secular transubstantiation takes place as Van Ordinaire seals the consanguinity of friends. From the start, her work has embraced daily happenstance, small private pleasures, the tea kettle on the boil, the act of writing. Affirm, uh, these things affirm a, are a life-affirming descant to songs, her songs of public suffering and trauma. Attention to, quote, routine wakings and sleepings, half and half caffeine-assisted mornings, laundry, stock pots, dust balls in the, in the hallway. Those things pull ordinary moments out of time and frame them in the extemporal realm of the page where homage is quotidian, and it becomes a religious prizing of what it means to be alive, drinking the coffee, finding the word. Such intense mindfulness honors and illuminates instants blessedly free of drama or strife, the moments that, if we are lucky, compose most of existence, those quiet moments. Hacker also writes eloquently of regret and loss. Her book, Winter Numbers, a title that alludes to the stages of cancer, confronts agonies of enfleshment, noting coolly, the others do not sing. And a poem in squares and courtyards elegizes a homeless man who died of hypothermia on the streets of Paris. In addition to her own poems, Hacker has given bilingual life to the work of other poets through her important translations. She said that the interest of translation is the challenge of making a new poem that is at once an accurate reflection in the mirror of a second language of the original poem and a poem that can stand alone in its new language. And also of working in the clay of one's own language, getting one's hands grubby with it, while necessarily leaving one's ego and sometimes aesthetic reflexes on the border of the field. I began by describing Hacker's formalist chops. And I'll close by saying that she also, perhaps more importantly, is a nonconformist. Her conversation with the history of poetics exceeds the received dimensions, integrating and reimagining several major traditions of 20th century poetry. There are vestiges of post-romanticism, traces of the confessional group, a feminist poetics of commitment, the diaristic anecdotal approach of both the New York and West Coast schools. In her work, I hear the demotic power of Adrienne Rich, the measured objectivity of Auden, and more recently, the ghost of the Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish. Though it bears traces of these and other allegiances, Hacker's lifelong engagement with literature as reader, editor, and translator has given rise to a body of work that is singular, hybrid, preternatural in its reaching grasp. Her poetry is sui generis, unprecedented. There is simply nothing like it, and there never was. 
an untiring voice for justice. She is among the few contemporary poets who deserve the honorific term poet of conscience. I've been waiting almost 20 years to hear her read. And like you, I don't want to wait another minute. Please join me in welcoming Marilyn Hacker. Well, thank you, thank you all, and thank you, Alice. That uh, was the, I think, the best introduction I've ever had, ever, anywhere from anybody. <laughs> Well, uh, oh, in fact, no, I think just because it's sitting here, uh, uh, this, this, this poem is a hazel, which is something we get from Persian and Urdu, etc. And it was uh, written a month or so after the elections uh, late last year. It's called, and the echo, of course, it's, it's called The Dark Times with the echo, of course, of Bartolt Brecht. Tell us that line again, the thing about the dark times, when the dark times come, we will sing about the dark times. They'll always be wrong about peace when they're wrong about justice. Were you wrong? Were you right, insisting about the dark times? The traditional fears, the habitual tropes of exclusion, like ominous menhirs close into their ring about the dark times. Naysayers in sequins or tweeds, libertine or ascetic, find a sensual frisson in what they'd call bling about the dark times. Some of the young can project themselves into a Marshall Plan future where they laugh and link arms reminiscing about the dark times. From every spotlit glitz tower with armed guards around it, some huckster pronounces his fiat's self-sacralized king about the dark times. In a tent, in a queue, near barbed wire, in a shipping container, please remember, ya achi, we too know something about the dark times. Sinbad's rock or Ganymede's eagle, some bird of rapacious ill omen from bleak skies descends and wraps an enveloping wing about the dark times. You come home from your meeting, your clinic, make coffee and look in the mirror and ask yourself once more what you did to bring about the dark times. This uh, is a poem that was uh, written for a good friend, a uh, Syrian political activist, Fadwa Suleiman. Uh, one day, a couple of years ago, uh, she and I were walking across, walking, walking across a, one of the bridges over the Seine in Paris, uh, talking in a mishmash of uh, French and Arabic. Uh, and um, we happened to see in the near distance a man whom we both recognized, uh, me because, who was also Syrian, me because I had seen him at a political gathering and she because she had last seen, seen him uh, making a speech in front of the clock tower in Humps where she too had spoken and then had been obliged to leave the country because her life was in danger. So, um, and um, so, and this is this, this one is a pontoon, and that's what it's called. Said the old woman, who barely spoke the language, "Freedom is a dream, and we don't know whose." Said the insurgent, who was now in exile. When I began to write the story, I started bleeding. Freedom is a dream, and we don't know whose. 
That man I last saw speaking in front of the clock tower when I began to write the story? I started bleeding five years after I knew I'd have no more children. That man I last saw speaking in front of the clock tower turned an anonymous corner and disappeared. Five years after I knew I'd have no more children, my oldest son was called up for the army, turned an anonymous corner and disappeared. My nephew, my best friend, my second sister, whose oldest son was called up for the army, are looking for work now in other countries. Her nephew, his best friend, his younger sister, a doctor, an actress, an engineer, are looking for work now in other countries, stumbling, disillusioned in a new language. A doctor, an actress, an engineer, wrestle with the rudiments of grammar, disillusioned, stumbling in a new language, hating their luck and knowing they are lucky. Wrestling with the rudiments of grammar, the old woman who barely speaks the language hated her luck. I know that I am lucky, said the insurgent, who is now in exile. And uh, speaking of political activists, this is a poem that's in part for the great American political poet activist Muriel Rukeyser. And it's called Crepuscule with Muriel, which is also a tip of the hat to Thelonious Monk for all you jazz buffs crep is remembering Crepuscule with Nelly. Instead of a cup of tea, instead of a milk silk whelk of a cup, of a cup of nearly six o'clock tea time, cup of a stumbling block, cup of an afternoon unredeemed by talk, cup of a cut brown loaf, of a slice, a lack of butter, blueberry jam that's almost black. Instead of tannin seeping into the cracks of a pot, the void of an hour seeps out, infects the slit of a cut I haven't the wit to fix with a surgeon's needle threaded with fine gauge silk as a key would thread the cylinder of a lock. But no key threads the cylinder of the lock. Late afternoon light, transitory, licks the place of the absent cup with its rough tongue, flicks itself out beneath the wheel's revolving spoke. Taut Thoughts gone with a blink of attention, slack. A vision of death and distance in the mix. She lost her words, and how did she get them back when the corridor of a day was a lurching deck? The dream life, logic encodes in nervous ticks. She translated to a syntax which connects intense and unfashionable politics with morning coffee. Hudson sunsets, sex, then the short circuit of the final stroke, the end toward which all lines looped out, then broke. What a gaze out the window interjects on the southeast corner, a black lab box tugged as the light clicks green toward a late day walk by a plump brown girl in a purple anorak. The Bronx-bound local comes rumbling up the tracks out of the tunnel over West Harlem blocks whose windows gleam on the animal warmth of bricks rouged by the fluvial light of six o'clock. And, uh, and uh, I don't know if, well, I'm sure there are other people here who are uh, subject to tension headaches, which are one of the uh, nastier things in life, especially if they come on you at three or four in the morning, waking you up and you can't, be can't get back to sleep. So, 
uh, and then all of the uh, things you didn't really want to think about come uh, uh, <laughs> trooping into your head. And um, so, uh, headaches. Wine again, the downside of any evening's bright exchanges, scribbled with retribution. Stark awake, a tick throbs in the left temple's sight of bombardment. Tortured syntax, thorned thoughts, vocabulary like a forest littered with unexploded cluster bombs, no exit except explosion ripping the branches. Stacks of shadowed books on the bedside table wall a jar of tiger bomb. You grope for its glass Netsuke hexagon. Tick stabs, dull pain supersedes voices. Still, stills obsessive one-sided conversations. Turn from mouths you never will kiss, a neck your fingers will not trace to a golden shoulder. Think of your elders. If, in fact, they died, the interlocutors who, alive, recede into incoherence, you would write the elegy, feel clean grief, still asking them questions. Though you know it's you who provide the answers. Auden's old people's home, Larkin's the old fools, are what come to mind not Yeats. In a not so distant past, someone poured a glass of wine at three in the morning, laid a fool's cap pad on the kitchen table, mined a spark from the long loquacious dinner two hours behind her. And you got a postcard, a 50s jazz club next day across town where she'd scrawled, she found the tail end of a good Sancerre in the fridge and finished the chapter. Now, she barely knows her friends when you visit. Drill and mallet work on your forehead. Basta, and it is Margaret you mourn for. Get up, go to the bathroom. You take the drugs, synapses buzz and click. You turn the bed lap on, open a book. Vasoconstrictor and barbiturate make words in oval light reverberate. The sky begins to pale at six o'clock. Uh, um, oh, oh, page just opened here, said, and, and this is again. I like this book. A few years ago, uh, there was a project going on in England where uh, uh, Poets were asked, were given the lyrics of Fado songs uh, translated from Portuguese, and um, asked to write poems that either um, uh, let the people leave who are leaving, um, uh, that um, um, I asked to write poems that uh, that were either. Uh, in some way, translations of these lyrics going, or, or simply poems that came out of those, um, uh, those, uh, of those lyrics. And I did three of these, and they were not, not, they're not at all translations. They uh, uh, take the, uh, the initial theme or image of the, of the, of the, of the Fado song and turned, and turned it into another, uh, another poem. And this one is from a rather famous Fado poem called uh, Batonero, Black Boat. If you were there when I woke with my barbed wire, with my bars, you would avert your green gaze. I would feel the chill of, of regret, though you said something else in sunlight over wine. I saw a cross on a tall rock, and a black boat danced on light. Someone waved. Was it you? A brown arm between white sails. Old women know that more go away than will ever return, than the morning has scars. 
in the wind as it blows wet sand against the panes, on the water that sings, in the fire as it dies, in blue sheets warmed by someone sleeping alone, on an empty park bench when they lock up the square, you are still there, brown arm, green gaze, black boat, blown sand, barbed wire. And um, this is a sequence of poems, that short se a short sonnet sequence, in fact, that was uh, written for my friend, a good friend, the painter, uh, Marie Geneviève Havel, who, uh, who died this summer. Um, and, uh, and it's about, it's about her. It, this was written, this was written it was a couple of years, several years before, before that happened. For it. Uh, and it's about her, it's about painting, uh, it's about uh, a lesbian bar uh, that used to be uh, on a street in Paris in the middle of the old, old Jewish quarter of the Marais, which made for uh, an uh, uneasy rubbing of elbows. And so there's a bit of all of that. And uh, Rue des Écouf is the name of the street that the bar is on, which was also a street famous because in one of the buildings on the street, um, uh, something like 44 families were taken away in the, uh, 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 on the 16th, of Ju the 16th of July in 1942 to uh, the internment camp in the, the Vélodrome d'Hiver, and most of them never came back. And there was also, much more recently on that street, a bar called Les a women's bar called Les Scandaleuses. So it's the uh, rubbing elbows of those, those things. And Rue des Écouffes. The street is narrow, and it just extends Rue de Rivoli, Rue des Rosiers, a street from which the children went away, clutching their mothers, looking for their friends on city buses used for other ends, one not yet humid morning in July. Now, kosher butchers coexist with gay boutiques, not gaily. Smooth-cheeked ephibes hold hands, Small boys with forelocks trail after bearded men. And I have dragged that story in again, and will inevitably next compare the curtains of the creaky balcony smelling of female exile exhaled prayer with the discreet shutters of the women's bar. Hung on the exposed brown stone of the bar's back wall, Words and collage on aquarelle, metaphor, a landscape, or a well-traveled sky, thigh, eye with a view of stars, her latest work. A child between two wars, she learned her own vision from the salty squall of Norman winters, learned what she couldn't tell except with brush, chalk, pencil, engraver's stylus and blade, with ink spilled on a stone as the sea spills up and over the stones when the tide comes in. Leather jacket, cap, she stands briefly alone at the bar with a glass of wine, her Celtic moonstone eyes as light and dark as the shape she made while the night's first women come in out the rain. The night's first women come in out of the rain, two couples who arrived in laced astride two motorcycles, pulled up just outside the door, doff, doff, helmets and leather, order gin tonic, beer, beer, a cure. From the bar they crane their necks toward the row, row of dreams, mindscapes, implied back roads they're too young to have traveled, slide closer together, wanting things to begin. Watching, she doesn't envy them their youth, their way, of, their way of being in a pack and pairs, wounds inflicted in the name of truth on friends, near infidelities on stairs. But the lacework beginning near that one's mouth is elegant, engravers grooves, soft dares. The elegant engraver's grooves, soft dares to follow, 
down to the glass-roofed quay, embark on the last train's last car, hurtling through the dark tunnel, irregularly blazed with flares, alizarin, viridian. Lit by the glares, a silhouette, androgynous, at work setting in Paris, London, Prague, New York, mosaic tiles. She leads you up spiral stairs into the blue explosion of the air's matinal brilliance, but she disappears. Avid flesh, mercurial avatar, desire, or imagination sends. And then you know exactly where you are. The street is narrow. You see where it ends. And oh, I'm going to read one more chazal because it's, it's they're you know, like peanuts. You can't eat just one. <laughs> and uh, this one was written in, I act, it was written in Konya in Turkey a couple of years ago, which is where, um, where Rumi uh, wrote, uh, lived and wrote. And there was a... Um, an international writers' conference that included people from Turkey, from Iran, from the United States, from Syria, uh, from Germany, uh, um, uh, from, uh, from Afghanistan, uh, talking in various languages, discussing in various languages the poetry of Rumi, and the, the Hazel is w w uh, one of the forms, in fact, that he used. And this one, and there was one extremely young woman, extremely young as in 23 or 24 years old from Afghanistan, whose name was Farkhanda, who, when, when there was, after this rather academic discussion of the Hazel with people talking in Farsi and being, and the poor simultaneous, simultaneous translators suffering um, because they weren't simultaneous translators by profession. They were other people at the conference who just happened to speak uh, uh, Farsi and English. And, but Farkhanda said, when she was a very small child in Afghanistan, uh, her uh, grandfather and uncles and their, fr their friends, also male, used to uh, get together and drink tea and recite chazals. Uh, and because she was a small child and a girl at that. She wasn't allowed to come into the room where they were doing that, but she would sit outside the door and listen to them reciting chazals out loud and, and uh, memorize as much as she could possibly could, or at least uh, of, of what they were, were reciting. And so uh, this poem is, uh, uh, well, it jumps from one thing to another thing, the way the, 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 way the chazal does, but it's dedicated to Farkanda outside the door. Laughter, music, voices singing verses can be heard outside the door. The little girl is memorizing every word outside the door. Light in the stairwell seen through the Judas hole. Is that the visitor you longed for or you feared outside the door? Long hours in laplight practicing his scales and counterpoint to solfege of a bird outside the door. The diplomat entering the leader's office forgets the copt, the communist, the Kurd, outside the door. Praise to the leader, loyalty till death. Another imprecation is whispered outside the door. The first love left, the second packs her bags. Are those the nervous footsteps of the third outside the door? Self is a mirror, poster color bright, but notice how the colors become blurred outside the door. The revolutionary's nameless laundress wonders what happens to a dream deferred outside the door. Um, Another, um, well, uh, what, uh, as, as Alice said, uh, one of the reasons of, for using you know, various poetic forms is to carry, in a way, to carry on conversations with the poets who have uh, worked uh, that way before. And one of, the, one of the forms that is most exactly a conversation is the glossa, in which, oh, it, uh, 
Spain, 16th century, uh, uh, in which a poet takes four lines from a, a, a poem by somebody else uh, and, uh, and, uh, and writes four stanzas, each one of which ends with one of those lines. And um, this is a glossa that I wrote uh, on a using four lines by a poem by the, by the French poet Claire Malhoux that I had translated myself. And the lines from Claire's poems are, Claire's poem are, blood's risks, its hollows, its flames, exchanged for the pull of that song, bone-colored road, bone-colored sky, through the white days of the storm. And the glossa. Once out of the grip of desire, or if you prefer, its embrace, free to do nothing more than admire the sculptural planes of a face, are you gay, straight, or bi? Are you queer? You still tell your old chaplet of names which, are, which were numinous once. You replace them with adjectives, witty, severe, trilingual, abstracting blood's claims, blood's risks, its hollows, its flames. No craving, no yearning, no doubt, no repulsion that follows release, no presence you can't do without, no absence an hour can't erase. The conviction no reason could rout of being essentially wrong is dispelled. What feels oddly like peace now fills space you had blathered about where the nights were too short or too long, exchanged for the pull of that song. But peace requires more than one creature released from the habit of craving on a planet that's mortgaged its future to the lot who are plotting and raving. There are rifts which no surgeon can suture overhead, in the street, under sea. The bleak plain from which you were waving mapped by no wise, benevolent teacher, is not a delight to the eye. Bone-colored road, bone-colored sky. You know that the weather has changed, yet do not know what to expect with relevant figures expunged and predictions, at best, incorrect. Who knows on what line you'll be ranged and who in what cause you will harm. What cabal or junta or sect has doctored the headlines arranged for perpetual cries of alarm through the white days of the storm? And, um, oh, what a, uh, this is a poem just uh, written just a few months ago, and I, I've actually never written it out loud. Read it out loud before. Um, and it's also for Fadwa Suleiman, the dedicatee of the first poem, uh, who was diagnosed with an inoperable lung cancer at the age of 46. Um, so, um, but it's also really for, 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 Fad, for Fadwa and for. Uh, all the work, all, everything she did. Um, just, it's called calligraphies. While the same rain fell on suburbs of exile and motherless children, whose courage was certainty, whose impatience turned to doubt, she came in the door like a comrade, lover, friend, and took off her shoes. Older than my daughter, but too young to be my sister. Sister of someone who was forced to denounce her on television, pacifist in Kefia, but they got guns anyway. She rolled impatient exilic cigarettes, wrote fables of mourning. The mother tucked the child in her bed and slit the dove's throat. Slit throat, cut throat, sun, slashed wrists of early spring rain. Wolves at a distance give up verse panegyrics and howl like 
politicians. Is hope a fatal disease or was that despair? The old woman sheared her gray hair short as a boy's, kneaded wine in dough like clay. Words were clay and wine, what I imagined she knew by heart recited. The boy who'd stood beside her was a killer now, or killed. They bore the cardboard coffin, cardboard clock tower at a crossing of Paris streets where her voice was already losing context. Not to lose contact with what she was, would be, she played it on TV, a Lebanese soap about political prisoners. Larger than life, she acts her life while she lives it, keeps writing the script, but not the body's misfires or defections in the blood. Blood in the orchard or a memory of blood a song about it, shepherds in all the stories, treason in most of your dreams. Walk in an orchard where you pick low-hanging fruit or shook down olives in another century's childhood before departures. How old was the child, her son, when she last saw him? Her choice, her story, but it's close to five years now. The boy near adolescence, as my daughter was at 12 and a half, 13, in orchards pendant to other hill villages, other declensions of loss. I declined to spool out or wind in someone else's narrative spiral. Don't want that poem to end cannot know how it began. Lead weights in my legs, because I didn't die young, age caught up with me, a face to frighten children with its own terrified eyes. Own my solitude, its immunocompromised auto-absorption. Write emails in her language, but she isn't answering. Up against the wall, with no windows on the street. Outside my windows, spring drains away through a sky mottled with silvery clouds. Mottled, nacreous throat of the dove at her throat, hope and betrayal in the book to be published, only poems, just paper. The Shabab cheered their Joan of Arc, on YouTube, she preceded herself toward the dovecote of her chest in a suburb of the rain. And I'll read one more poem. I think. Uh, OK, this is um, uh, uh, this last poem is another, another glossa for, uh, for, for another political dissident, uh, Anna Akhmatova, the great Russian poet. And uh, in, in, this, in this poem, the, the four lines glosed are from Judith Hemschmeyer's translation of Akhmatova's poem, Willow. Uh, and the speaker of the poem is someone like Akhmatova, where who, who as m most of you may, might know, uh, during the Stalinist period was forbidden to publish, and uh, so she would write poems, and then she uh, and uh, one friend or another, and very often uh, this was a young widow named uh, Lydia Chupskayeva who wrote a memoir about it. Uh, they, they'd read the poem until they had both memorized it, and then they would you know, burn it over the ashtray. Um, and the lo so the lines from Akhmatova's poem, and I grew up in pattern tranquility in the cool nursery of the new century. And the voice of man was not dear to me, but the voice of the wind I could understand. A sibilant wind presaged a latish spring. Bare birches leaned and whispered over the gravel path. 
Only the river ever left. Still, someone would bring back a new sailor midi to wear in the photograph of the four of us. Sit still, stop fidgeting. Like the still leafless trees with their facility for lyric prologue and its gossipy aftermath, I like to make up stories. I like to sing. I was encouraged to cultivate that ability, and I grew up in patterned tranquility. In the single room with a greasy stain like a scar from the gas fire's fumes, when any guest might be a threat, and any threat was a guest from the past or the future, at any hour of the night, I would put the tea things out, though there were scrap leaves of tea, but no sugar, or a lump or two of sugar, but no tea. Two matches, a hoarded cigarette, my day's page ashed on its beer in a bedsitter. No godmother had presaged such white nights to me in the cool nursery of the young century. The human voice distorted itself in speeches, a rhetoric that locked locks and ticked off losses. Our words were bare as that stand of winter birches, while poetasters sugared the party boss's edicts, the only sugar they could purchase, with servile metaphor and simile. The effects were mortal, however complex the causes. When they beat their child beyond this thin wall, his screeches, wails, and pleas were the gibberish of history. And the voice of man was not dear to me. Men and women, I mean, those high-pitched voices, how I wanted them to shut up. They sound too much like me, little machines for evading choices, little animals selling their minds for touch. The young widow's voice is just hers as she memorizes the words we read and burn, nights when we read and burn with the words unsaid, hers and mine, as we watch and are watched, and the river reflects what spies. Is the winter trees rustling a code to the winter land? But the voice of the wind, I could understand. Thank you. Um, if, if, if there are people who want to ask questions, we can do that. What is your favorite thing about translating poems from one language to another? Well, usually it's the, po it's the poem itself that I'm translating, which is to say a, a feeling of, you know, yes, I want to do that. Uh, but there really also is the um, the experience of trying to make a poem in a mind that is not entirely my own, uh, like get, you know, just getting into a different head, both in, ter uh, both in terms of approaches to poetry, but also, also in terms of experience, in terms of, uh, of, relation to, of relationship to a language or, or languages. Um, so it's, a, uh, it's at once a good break from my own work and also very often a good way back to it. I know an awful lot of good work has been done that way, but uh, I, 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 have, I have never done that. Uh, when I translate from Arabic, after I've done the first draft, I go over it with, some, with, with, with someone who's a native speaker to make, make sure I have not made any howlers. But I don't, it's not a question of asking him or her to 
to do a first draft. It's to see, you know, you know did I get that right? And sometimes, I, I, sometimes there are howlers and I correct them. And sometimes it's a question of, or, well, yes, that's right, but there are there are six other words with, <laughs> with, uh, that you could use for that, and this one has more interesting resonances. Uh, in French, well, I'm pretty bilingual, so I don't. I, I will want to read it, read something again myself, and if the poet or himself or herself happens to be or happens to be bilingual. So I, I was talking to the grad the grad students today, as with, with, as with Claire Melville, who is herself a, a, a renowned translator of poetry from English, including Emily Dickinson and uh, uh, Wallace Stevens and Derek Walcott. So obviously, I'll go over <laughs> any translation with her. But then a lot of people have translated. Uh, uh, don't, from French, uh, don't have English, and that they may well have some other language. But so, uh, so you know, in that case, I'm depending on what I've done. On what I've done. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Pauline Oliveros. Sure. The composer Pauline Oliveros. They, I believe, last year. Did you ever meet her? Or? Uh, pa Pauline. Oh, no, I, I, alas, I didn't. I, 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 I of course, yeah, I, I know, I, I know who she was, but uh, I, I didn't have the privilege. Sorry. <laughs> You mean kept you know kept a draft kept a draft after somebody uh, after someone went uh, went over it and said, uh, well uh, yes in fact uh, I've uh, I've just you know, for my own edification or to see or or to or, or to compare and I suppose it, it's entirely conceivable that in a fourth or fifth draft I I would think or or maybe even after talking about it with you know yet another interlocutor I and mean, one of the interesting things about you know working with a language where you know I I'm still still just a student that I very one person might say well you know there are five other words for that and I think this one's better and then I talked to someone else and, and who and she would say well there um, uh, no I think the, I think the, the the first one you had is, is in fact better or no there's here's another alternative so I mean it becomes an endless um, Conversation, but yeah, it's. I think it's always interesting to keep those drafts, uh, and not only for translation. I mean, but for just for for my own work too, or for one's own work, um, to go back and see, you know, what you uh, what you got rid of, what you you know might you know want to be able want to recuperate for something else. Uh, and I, I would also like to you know add that very often. Uh, or you know, increasingly, uh, you know, there's some, you know, the the the, the glosses are the maybe the most obvious, but in, in many you know less obvious ways, ideas or um, turns of language that I've you know come across in translation then uh, uh, find their way into my own poems or or become the become the jumping off point. Uh, uh, for uh, for uh, for a poem, and there's I mean, there's one poem in here where uh, a um, uh, actually my good friend Fadi Judah, who is a Palestinian poet, who's a wonderful poet in English, and who's also an, oh, an excellent translator from Arabic into English, once sent me this couplet in Arabic. He didn't say anything about it, and he said, you know, can you can you translate this? And I translated, and I said, well, yes, and did. And then he explained that it was an extremely famous um, uh, a, a, a couplet from from. Uh, a, a, from classic, uh, classical Arabic poetry, from a poet named uh, Amr bin, bin Mad Yakrib, uh, that in fact Darwish also makes makes reference to in some of his poems. But then I took my translation of this couplet that he'd thrown to me out of the air, and you know, and wrote a poem that started with my translation of the couplet because why not? <laughs> but, uh, um, and, the, and it was an extremely simple couplet. It, uh, it's uh, 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 those 
those whom I love have gone, and I, and, and, and I remain alone like a stone. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that was a pretty good, uh, good jumping off point. <laughs> Yes. Um, you could talk a little bit. Now. My students are here. You've read your Sorry? My students are here. And I think maybe it would be helpful to talk a little bit about your process of writing your own poems. Um, writing one poem? How do you how do you begin? Do you think of the subject and then you think of the form? Um, um, uh, is, usually, it messy? is it messy? Is it messy for you? Perfect uh, each line before you go to the next line. Um the the they usually come. They usually come together. And something and there, uh, that is, that is to say, uh, uh, what what it's about or what it might be going to be about. And uh, uh, and by the time I've gotten to the you know gotten to the third or fourth line, I have an idea of um, yeah, this is going to be this is a long line. This is going to be, this, is, this is a short line. This is a syllabic line or. Um, or, the, or uh, yes, rhyme or repetition would be useful, or uh, or a uh, met or non-rhymed metrical pattern like like uh, sap or like uh, the sapphic stanza or the archaic stanza would you know, that 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 would be that would be fun or that would be a challenge or they or that would uh, yeah. so uh, but they 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 tend to come together it's, un, unless it's really someone says. Uh, could you write up? Mm. <laughs> and I say, you know, yes, yes. Why, why shouldn't I? Um, and, uh, they, uh, what are they? Um, and you know, sometimes, obviously, it comes from reading something that somebody that somebody else has written. Whether uh, the the, the, the Glossa, for example, uh, oh, there was a, a Canadian poet named P.K. Page, a woman who died of few years ago in her 90s, and she wrote a whole book of glosses, um, and the, um, which, which had, now I'm blanking on the title, which is awful, it had, pl had planet in it, uh, but that was one of, the, one of the reasons for the interest in the glossa was, well, I never thought about that before, and it, and it also seemed like, um, an interesting way to illustrate the fact that I think really that, that so much poetry is in dialogue, uh, a dialogue with another, uh, another poet and also with the time and place and, and situation in which, uh, uh, in, in which that poet lived and worked. Well, thank you all for being here. <laughs> I think, uh, for, for one thing, I I I think for, in for for one thing, I think you know that the that that uh, well, well, well several things. In a way, I think any successful poem is formal. You know, and what, you know uh, that is to say, it has a, that not that that doesn't mean that I think that the op that open form that open form poems aren't poems. Of course they are, but that the open form poem. Uh, each open form poem creates a form of its own, which I think, is, if it's successful, and I, I, that doesn't mean that it has that it that it give, that the poet gives it metrical or syllabic constraints, or uh, but that uh, there's a reason why it's shaped the way it is. Uh, uh, but uh, I think there, I think, for, I mean, for me, there's a real balance between the well, just as there's a balance between the. Uh, the uh, personal and what is not at all personal because it is either about real other people and situations or entirely fictional other people and, and, and situations, which I think is probably true of novelists too, even when, when, we are one, when one is writing something that's entirely fiction. Um, 
but uh, uh, there's uh, there, uh, there, there, there's there's also a way in which the uh, the metrical or stanzaic form um, uh, not exactly contains the personal, but sh but gives it a shape, gives it you know gives gives it gives it some kind gives it so that, so that even if uh, there is something that is n about me, quote unquote, or is some experience that I have had, or uh, uh, the the shape of the poem also makes it somehow larger than that, um, uh, because it calls in well what the whole the whole the whole, the whole, his, the, the, whole the whole history of the form, the dialogue of oh uh, well I, I'm I'm writing this and I'm also thinking about what you know James Wright or. Uh, um, Tony Harrison, or uh, or Auden, or um, Edna Saint Vincent Millay, or any number of other people, or John Donne, um, was uh, thinking about with a similar form and a similar and and uh, and, a, and a similar situation. But it's a, but it's all the but there's also the uh, uh, it's also a question of I think being made much more aware of the musical quality of language that uh, you are after all making something you know you're you're, you're not uh, uh, telling something to the person next to you next it was sitting next to you on the bus you are making something out of language and there are many many ways of doing that and uh, but I, I think it's with all of them it's important to remain remain, con remain conscious of the fact that you're making something out of language <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.